We've now been on insane missions. We've taken out cars, trains, tanks. I'm not gonna even mention the submarine. And yet we're still here. Exactly. In the two decades since Dom Toretto and his crew started boosting DVD players in Long Beach, a very talented group of filmmakers and technicians have been pushing the art and craft of designing car chases to the absolute limit. The ingredient for us, with whatever crazy idea, let's start with a car, let's crash it, let's do whatever with it practically, and that will be our starting off point. While I haven't been able to avoid CGI in some of their more bombastic sequences, the Fast and Furious franchise prides itself on doing it for real. And in today's Hollywood, that's a rare principle that deserves to be celebrated. <laughs> so, if you've ever wondered how the f did they shoot that, good, because this is the evolution of the Fast and Furious car chases. We started doing these films 20 years ago, when all that was available was practical. The Fast and Furious franchise started from some real humble beginnings. It was based on a 1998 Vibe magazine article titled Racer X, which highlighted the underground tuning scene in LA. From the drop, this film always knew the cars were the stars, and it had some great action sequences, despite what now would be considered low-stakes reasons for the Toretto family to get into a car chase. Winning's winning. The film's opening scene, where three Civics hijack a truck full of DVD players, seems mundane on paper, but this opening heist really stood out despite its $38 million budget. From a technical perspective, it has everything that could make a chase compelling. Precision driving, check. High-risk stunt work, check. An element of surprise when things don't go totally according to plan, also check. And let's be honest, watching this Civic squeeze in under the truck, f***ing rules. The chase was so good, the climax is functionally the same heist, but where things go to hell. They even pull a bigger budget version of the heist again in a later movie, but we'll get to that in a bit. And it's these heist chases that make this movie rather unique. Most car chases involve a pursuit, either to catch up or outrun other characters or consequences. In The Fast and the Furious, the chase itself is the mission instead of being a repercussion of the mission. In this way, these Fast and Furious heists work more like the dogfights in Top Gun, where the characters, in control of their own vehicles, work together to achieve their goals. Instead of what most car chases are used for, escape. Back to the climax in Fast and the Furious for a second. Not only is it exhilarating to watch Dom, Letty, and Leon swarm this truck, but the stunt work for Vince's character is fantastic. Watching these stuntmen hang off the semi while getting shot at and going like 40 miles an hour does exactly what a good chase scene is supposed to do. It keeps you on the edge of your seat. The film's director, Rob Cohen, ensured the car chases in Fast and the Furious are very compelling from a narrative and action standpoint, but the film's stunt coordinator, Mick Rogers, also worked to change the way car chases were shot. He invented a new vehicle for shooting action shots of car interiors with the actors in the car. It's called the Mick Rig. Really, you've got footage that have put the actors at that level with like Steve McQueen who can drive, and, and they don't have to drive because I am. You go to tow someone, it's always slow. It's always like, you can't do anything with a big wide trailer. My idea was the Mick Rig, which basically an elongated van. It's actually much more effective because you can go faster, you can slide it. It's going to be the new uh, standard, I think, for, for chase footage, putting actors in the chase. Basically, the stunt team stripped these cars of their engines and tires and fixed the body and interior onto the back of this van chassis, which allowed them to attach lights and cameras to capture the actor doing the stunts in the car. In reality, it was Mick or one of his guys driving the rig doing power slides, while the likes of Vin or Paul mined it in the cars. The Mick rig was such an advancement in the way car interiors of action sequences were shot, the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences awarded it its Technical Achievement Award in 2001. The heists weren't the only driving scenes that really stood out in the film, though. The 
Drag Race sequences also did their part to influence the vibe of the franchise. Using blurs, speed lines, and a decent amount of CGI, the film did a great job of creating the tunnel vision feeling which conveys the speed of the drag race in a fresh and unique way. That scene, despite its heavy use of CGI, probably had the biggest cultural impact early on. It brought NOS to the mainstream, and without that scene, Need for Speed Underground probably wouldn't have been developed. But there was one drag race that was all real, and is probably the coolest shot in the movie. Yep, I'm talking about when Dom Barrel rolls the Charger completely over Brian's car. Pipe ramps have been done a lot of times, but not as realistic as we've done. You, you, you'll swear the Charger hit a truck. What makes this shot so great is that it's shown from inside the Supra as the Charger gracefully rolls over it. We've seen that barrel roll before in movies, like The Man with the Golden Gun, but never from this perspective. And thanks to a great edit, we get to see the Charger elegantly soar from inside the Supra. Then it cuts to a wide where it violently comes back to Earth, reminding us the sheer amount of power it took to pull off the trick in the first place. That's not what I had in mind. In the beginning, the producers were nervous it wouldn't be able to stand out after 2000's Gone in 60 Seconds remake, but its depictions of LA's foreign tuning culture really struck a nerve. This movie made $207 million on its $38 million budget, so of course there was going to be a sequel. Go! Too Fast, Too Furious is a sequel in every sense of the word. It may not be the most memorable film of the franchise, but it takes what made the first one good and then adds a bit to it. Tej and Roman become part of the Fast and Furious fam, and it also did its best to try and amplify key stunts from the first one. One of the best shots in the original was Dom's barrel roll in the Charger. When the car hits the ground, it does a great job visually communicating the raw force it takes to get a car that high into the air. Too Fast, Too Furious uses a drawbridge jump to exaggerate that same feeling. Yes, that first race also uses some unmistakable CGI to achieve some truly bombastic visuals. But director John Singleton also knew that at least some of that chase needed to be real. It may not be as obvious as Brian's CGI leapfrog, but it took a ton of work to pull off the bridge jump in Suki's pink S2000. Since the S2000 was a convertible, they couldn't hide a roll cage into the car, which was needed to make the jump safer for the driver. So the stunt team turned the car into a giant remote-controlled vehicle. But there was a catch. The S2000 could only drive in second gear, and it was controlled by the stunt team in a chase vehicle that needed to stay within 100 feet of it. On the day of the shoot, the actual ramp was only 6 feet off the bridge, while the S2000 survived the jump, but the follow car did not. The brakes on the pursuit vehicle weren't as good as they thought, and it wasn't able to stop before going over the ramp. Luckily, only minor injuries occurred when the airbags went off. Even early on, the Fast and Furious franchise has always managed to balance CGI with grounded, in-real-life stunts. Watching those Civics drive under the big rigs in the first was fun as hell, but it also came with a feeling that could only come from that Beavis and Butthead giggling on the couch side of my brain. Man, wouldn't it be cool to see that tractor trailer run over the car? <laughs> Luckily, John Singleton was thinking the same thing, because the real highlight of that mid-movie chase was watching the Mustang get absolutely chewed up by those tractor trailers. Like the first Fast and Furious, director John Singleton knew he had to end his film on a big stunt. Yeah, we do some real, real, what I call new millennium Dukes of Hazard stuff, you know. That's a pretty good way to describe the Camaro jump into the yacht, and it took three months to plan the sequence. Getting the car rigged on the back of the boat and making it look like we crashed it, it was done in two pieces, actually. The first piece was jumping the Camaro off the dock. To get the car ready, they had to remove pretty much everything that made it a car. The engine, the transmission, anything heavy really, and all of the fluids had to go. They put in a fake bottom too. It was basically just a Camaro body and some wheels, because they had to make that car as light as possible so it could get as much distance on the jump as possible. When they were ready to shoot, they towed the car to get it up to speed, and then... I think we jumped that car. 150 feet. Of course, the interior shots of Brian and Roman Airborne were done on a green screen, but the landing on the yacht? That's real. Kind of. They reconstructed a part of the yacht in a parking lot and also rigged it with some pyrotechnics and beat up pieces of the boat. So when the car hit, there would be some debris kicked up. For the car, they built what basically amounts to an industrial zip line, and it was ready to shoot. Fingers on button and action! 
Stunt-wise, Too Fast, Too Furious did some interesting things with its car chases, but it was still clearly swimming in the wake of the original. For the third entry in the franchise, they knew they were going to need a new hook for audiences. You know what DK stands for? Donkey Kong. Drift King. For the third entry of the franchise, the producers decided to bring in someone new. Justin Lin, who managed to get Hollywood's attention with his first feature, Better Luck Tomorrow. That movie was so good, it also serves as the non-official backstory for Han. While this might be Lin's first Fast and Furious, it certainly wouldn't be his last. Lin would go on to direct half of the franchise, with Tokyo Drift serving as a learning ground for Lin to work out his philosophies about how to shoot car chases. Like what needs to be real and what is okay to fake on the streets of Tokyo. Well, Tokyo and LA. A lot of the film was shot in Los Angeles. Tokyo Drift's first race, where where Sean and Tim the Toolman Taylor's oldest son rip through an under construction housing development is crucial because it sets up the type of race that this film is going to leave behind. Despite the lack of the franchise staple NOS, this is a race all about brute force. It's emphasized in car choice. Clay's Viper has a V10 engine and the 350 V8 in Sean's Monte Carlo was no slouch. And it's also emphasized in the race's complete lack of grace. They power slide into porta potties, drive through the framing of unfinished houses, houses and bump into each other down a straightaway before the Viper slams into some construction supplies and Sean flips his car like one, two, three, seven times, I think. Can I get a copy of that? The point is that this race was a real street fight and was meant to contrast the rest of the film, which aspires to be a more elegant type of racing, drifting. If you look at it from far away, it's pretty amazing. It is like ballet. When you get close, it's all about the rubber being burnt and, and these tiny particles just shooting in your eye because it's just everything disintegrates. <laughs> While the first garage race in Tokyo perfectly contrasted the housing development chase by showing Sean that brute force won't get him the street cred he desires, it was the drift lesson up the mountain that proved more difficult to film. And these guys were hanging it off the edge, and if they roll the tire off the rim, they're down 80, 90, 100 feet on top of these huge rocks. Not only was the mountain in a dangerous location to shoot, but they also needed the driving to look like it was being done by an amateur. And to do it all safely, they brought in this guy. Keiichi Suchia is a drifting legend. He's actually known as Drift King, thanks to his use of drifting in non-drifting racing events, and is one of the major forces that popularized drifting in the first place. These scenes of Sean clumsily drifting up the mountain, that was actually Suchia. If you have a lot of skill, you can perform high speed drifting. It's extremely difficult to mimic driving poorly. So there were a couple of times when he actually got scolded. It doesn't look bad enough. Suchia planned out the stunts with Terry Leonard, the second unit director, who went out of his way to emphasize how bad the driving needed to be. Make it look as stupid as possible. Completely hey. messed up. That makes no sense at all, but that's what we're trying to accomplish. Very, very sloppy. But when it worked, <laughs> the mountain ascent was a tricky scene to shoot because of the potentially dangerous driving conditions, but it was the final chase through Tokyo that proved to be the most complex. The Tokyo chase is pivotal, and this is the centerpiece of our movie. The one thing you notice when you're in Tokyo, especially Shibuya Square, there's thousands of people crossing. <laughs> I felt like this was important to show our characters trying to avoid what's naturally organically there. We didn't shoot this in Tokyo, obviously, because it was impossible, but I really felt like it was important to have this go through Shibuya, so we ended up creating a set on a parking lot in Burbank. Creating the film's fake Shibuya Square took a ton of shipping crates and lights, which would be replaced in post with a CGI city. To get his crowded Shibuya Square, Justin Lin couldn't avoid using CGI, but he was comfortable with it because he understood what absolutely could not be faked. I wanted to make sure that the car moves are all real, so that the only CG work is the buildings, the way the car, the smoke's coming off the car. 
I wanted all that to be real, as real as possible. Finding the balance of what could be cheated with CGI and what absolutely positively needed to be photographed is something that Justin Lin continued to experiment with in all his Fast and Furious movies. And when a stunt needed to be done in real life, he was also figuring out new ways to photograph those as well. The first Fast and Furious film gave birth to the Mick Rig. For Tokyo Drift, Justin Lin employed this go-kart to get some eye-level shots of the action. And it looks like his IRL Lakitu was the platform he used to help get one of Lin's favorite shots of the film. One of my favorite shots was when we went through Shibuya Square, it was all one shot. Like you could actually go 360 around and it was very difficult. I wanted you to get a sense of the car as it's, it's drifting through the square and I wanted to go through people. Unfortunately, Tokyo Drift disappointed at the box office. It was the lowest performing movie of the franchise, bringing in only $159 million on an $85 million budget. The franchise was at a crossroads. Go the American Pie route and keep producing lower and lower budgeted direct-to-DVD sequels, or plunk down another 85 million, woo back the original cast, and try their hand at a reboot call. Alright. Let's race. Mm -hmm. Fast and Furious may be the most textbook example of a reboot quote, and that's not a bad thing. It brought back the original cast, and most importantly, it got to flex its bigger budget by remaking the first chase from the first movie at a scale that the original never could have afforded. It's kind of an homage to the first film. The first film opens up with them in the little stealth cars and, and taking on a, you know, an 18-wheeler. How do you do that bigger? You know, well, you attach five other trailers to it and fill it with gasoline. Of course. That whole segment really is an introduction or reintroduction of Dom and Letty. And Michelle Rodriguez really stepped up for this scene. She did most of her own stunts. She is definitely an athlete. She wants to go for it. Um, we had her hanging off the back of that semi, going 40 miles an hour, and she was fine with it. She was like, just give me more. Letty was definitely earning her paycheck, hopping around this big rig land train, detaching these tankers of gasoline, all while the truck driver was trying to flick her off like a fly. But she wasn't the only one in this chase pulling off some incredible stunts. The drivers of one of the two trucks did something many of the crew weren't sure was possible. The car had to do a 180 and in one continuous flowing motion can carry on in reverse. And uh, you know, originally we were talking about doing it in multiple takes. Well, the first time out the stunt guy jumped in and it did it flawlessly, just you know, spun around, clicked it in reverse, and you know, away it went 30, 40 miles an hour. Uh, that's as good as you're probably gonna get. That may sound like luck, especially since they did it on the first take, but nailing that 180 in a single shot was really important to director Justin Lin, so much so that he plunked down serious money to make sure he had a truck that was capable of doing it. We actually had to spend a lot of money <laughs> building this truck. This is something that we've designed and we built just for this movie. It was very costly, but it was worth it, and it was good to see it in the sequence where I didn't have to edit. I literally just let the camera going. It wouldn't be a Fast and Furious chase if the best driving stunt was a truck doing a 180. Shots like Dom dislodging tankers, Letty's leap of faith, and Dom getting rear-ended by the truck were all exhilarating as well. A big part of what made those stunts so impactful was the way they were photographed. The franchise has been a constant innovator in how its filmmakers photographed their action, and the fourth entry continued this legacy. Yes, the film still relied on its old methods. The Mick rig was used to shoot the interiors of Tego and Rico 182 truck spin. They also brought in these pursuit vehicles as well, which are basically huge remote controlled jibs mounted on SUVs. They're extremely good at getting really dynamic shots like this and have become increasingly common on big budget chase sets because they're just so versatile. Anyway, they needed all the cameras they could get plus a helicopter to shoot what was the biggest explosion yet in a Fast and Furious movie, but don't take my word for it. Listen to this man, who was clearly ecstatic to be at work that day, explain all that went into this one stunt. Well, I'm feeling pretty good about this. We've got uh, a whole bunch of gasoline, a whole bunch of debt card in here. We've got a big old 80 ton crane to pull these over the edge. We got seven cameras. We're good to go. The tanker jumping over Dom was clearly CGI, but its impact into the truck and the other tankers was absolutely real. And this moment right here, where it quickly cuts from a CGI action to a real stunt, is something Lin will increasingly tinker with in his future entries, especially in 5's train heist and 7's building jump, where he learns how to better sell 
meld the CGI by incorporating elements of a single stunt that are actually photographed. But Lin's biggest test of skill came during the climax. For the finale, I thought it was appropriate to have a tunnel because a lot of what logistically that take place is the smuggling of the drugs. So I thought it'd be appropriate to have a chase through there. And it was the most difficult thing I think I've ever had to do. First, they tried to scout real tunnels in Mexico, but that didn't work out. Shooting on location in those tight tunnels would have forced him to make too many compromises creatively. Those tunnels were just too tight to fit both camera and cars in the ways that would have allowed him to get the coverage he wanted. Lin had to make a choice, CGI tunnels or CGI cars. CG was used to enhance environments, but it wasn't used to create cars so that someone that is in the cars, the one thing that they love, which is the tangible car on the street, was taken away from them. They ended up constructing their own tunnels set in a thousand foot long warehouse. It's real easy to draw comparisons between this tunnel sequence and the Shibuya Square sequence in Tokyo Drift. In both instances, Lin chose to fake the surroundings because, like an expert magician, he understands and exploits the limits of human perception. The tunnels may be fake, but as long as Lin continues to create unique car maneuvers and photograph collisions in ways the audience has never seen before, they'll be too busy looking at the mayhem to contemplate the photorealism of the background. I think any time that you can remove from the audience the sense that this is something that was safely done, <laughs> the better. And that goes all the way down to the look of it. Justin Lin and Co. clearly proved to the studio that the Fast and Furious franchise was never meant to be direct to DVD. While the reboot quill cool wasn't the best film in the franchise, at that moment, it was the most successful. And for the next one, the studio wanted them to tinker with the formula and was going to give them $125 million to do it. Instead of being a franchise centered around illegal street racing, the creatively titled Fast Five would now be more of an action movie. Director Justin Lin and writers Chris Morgan and Gary Scott Thompson would add a few fight scenes and shootouts to a heist movie that, of course, created a copious amount of car carnage. Fast and Furious paid homage to the first film by recreating the original heist just on a bigger budget. Well, I guess one good turn deserves another. Fast Five was also going to open on a genre callback, but one almost as old as cinema itself. The train heist, it was an attempt for us to one-up the classic stagecoach train robbery. We wanted to do our Fast and Furious version of that without horses, <laughs> but a whole lot of horsepower. Fast Five train heist wouldn't have the charm of Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. Thank you, enough dynamite there, Butch. Or be as hauntingly cinematic as the Roger Deakins photographed heist from the assassination of Jesse James by the coward Robert Ford. But it would be expensive as f. The production was going to pony up $25 million for it. We had to get permission to basically own a piece of railroad, working railroad, and then we had to buy trains, and then we had to, you know, build these trucks that were able to go up against the trains. Not only did they have to buy a train, but they also had to acquire a load of vehicles. These rugged off-road types used to execute the heist were all custom built from the ground up. The heist also needed some cars to steal, preferably expensive ones. They wouldn't be going through all this effort for a couple of Fords. Well, one Ford, I guess, but those classic Ferrari beating GT40s aren't cheap, and neither was the Di Tommaso Pantera. As for the car Dom was going to jump out of the train with, they needed something a little cheaper. That's why Dom's driving a 1963 Corvette, which isn't even real. The production spent $500,000 on a dozen of these cars from Mongoose Motorsports, a company that specializes in producing these replicas. What do you think? Yeah, it's definitely a custom ship. Now that they've acquired all the vehicles they needed for the sequence, they still had to figure out exactly how they were going to do it all. The key for us was how much can we do practical opposed to how much was going to end up being green screen or computer generated. The train heist actually has a ton of CGI. While some of it is pretty obvious, the stunt team did an incredible job ensuring that at least some elements of every stunt were grounded in reality. All of these shots of the heist trucks driving next to the train were actually shot. Even the shots of the trucks pulling the vehicles out of the train were practically done, just at slower speeds than the scene would lead you to believe. 
The CGI basically comes in anytime the main actors are used. Even then, it's mostly just background replacements. Yes, these close-ups of Paul Walker fighting to regain control of the truck are also CGI, but these wide shots, which establish the action, were all shot with real stuntmen using safety wires. However, the production did hit one major snag because of its commitment to practical effects. This shot, where the truck drives into the side of the train, wasn't supposed to happen. I mean, we were like millimeters off. If it was just a little bit more push, that train would have overturned and it would have just killed the production. It was supposed to just bump the train, but the Fast and Furious team, taking a lesson from Bob Ross, just rewrote the script to accommodate the happy accident. Even after the flub jump, there was still one car left to steal, which, in typical Fast and Furious fashion, was completely real. Once that car comes out of there, it's going to come out at about 70 miles an hour. So it's liable to be pretty violent. The stunt team used an air cannon to shoot the vet out of the train, and when it hit the ground, it became very obvious why the production went with the cheap option, choosing to buy a dozen replicas. Hell, that wasn't even the only time in this scene they were going to treat those vets like one of those Nerf bows and arrows from the 90s. Nerf bow and arrows! They'll use the same trick moments later to launch the Corvette into the river. And honestly, that final leap into the river is probably more real than it is fake. We did it in two passes. One where the stunt guys jump into the water from the same platform, and then we launch the Corvette as a separate pass for safety, and then marry the two in post. Even though the close-up shots of Dom and Brian were done with some wire work and green screen, the wide shots were the real deal. This scene clearly leveled up what a Fast and Furious action scene could be. It did so by building on lessons from Fast and Furious. This heist featured significantly more CGI than the tanker heist of the previous film, but it feels way less noticeable because Justin Lin and the stunt team did a way better job of sandwiching slivers of CGI in between the practically photographed elements of the stunts. For Fast Five's climax, Justin Lin knew he needed something audiences have never seen before. Sure, the fun people at Vulture, who took the time to mathematically prove what everyone knew in their hearts already knew to be true. Well, I want to know how you know all that. That this vault chase wasn't physically possible. But this Fast and Furious movie has a $100 million plus budget for a reason. To ensure the laws of physics don't apply once the cameras are rolling. The vault chase starts a new era of Fast and Furious action sequences, which aren't bound by what's physically possible. Possible. Instead, Justin Lin leans on the creativity of his stunt, special effects, and CGI teams to make the impossible seem possible, if only for a few frames. The Vault Chase set a new standard of what an absurd, which I say with complete love and admiration, Fast and Furious car chase could be. Of course, there's always discussion about, how are you going to do it? Like, we should just do it CG or whatever, and I was like, no, 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 no. Let's just build what a vault would look like, and I said, let's just go out and just tow it around and see what happens. They did that only to quickly realize that whipping chargers around corners with a fake vault in tow was impossible to control and would level anything that got in its way. That was a big issue because when you're in Puerto Rico, you can only destroy the things that you tell them you're going to hit. There was really only one solution to this. They were going to have to make the vault steerable. We took a pickup truck, a heavy-duty pickup truck, and we saw the entire back part of it off. So now it's a very short pickup truck. And we said, we're going to put a vault over the top of this thing. And we're going to put tiny little viewing holes on the front and tiny little viewing holes on the side. And then we're going to be able to drive it in places where it needs to steer through turns and not really hit anything. The truck in a vault was a great idea for safety and to make sure the safe always hit its mark. But it would take more than one fake vault to get all the shots they needed. To pull off this shot where Dom and Brian pull the vault through a bank, the special effects team built a vault that had an axle through the middle of it so it would roll. The vault team also needed some room to get up to speed, so a lead-up track was built and would start tumbling once it crashed through the windows. To make things even more complicated, stunt people were used to act as bank customers in front of the camera to emphasize the danger. For us to be able to get through that with nobody getting hurt, because there were a lot of unknowns in that bank vault sequence. There were a lot of things that could have gone wrong, but we had luck on our side. There was still one section of the bank chase left to shoot. Lin and Co. really cranked up the car carnage once the vault and chargers got to the bridge. There was so much going on on this bridge. I mean, you had 14 cars, I think, head on with this vault. You are being crushed, destroyed, flipped, knocked in the air, knocked off the bridge, falling 30 feet into the water below, two cars at the same time. I mean, cars being decapitated. To execute the mayhem needed on this bridge, yet more vault types were needed. 
For shots like this, where the vault had to absolutely obliterate a car in a head-on collision, the stunt team attached part of the vault to a semi-truck. And to knock these cars into the drink, they used a crane to turn one of the vaults into a pendulum. That's not all, folks. They also decided it'd be cool to decapitate a car, too. This didn't require a vault, but it did require their shortest stuntman. And it didn't require a ton of movie magic, either. Yes, they had to pull a wire and yank the roof for dramatic effect, but the cable did decapitate the car. And it would have decapitated the driver, too, had he not ducked right before the cable hit. And they couldn't do it in just one take. He did it three times. What's your primary concern? Get down! In Fast Five, Justin Lin made the biggest Fast and Furious movie in every sense of the word. It had the biggest budget at $630 million. It brought in the most money, it created the family vibe of the big ensemble cast, and it became a franchise that was about more than just illegal street racing. In short, Justin Lin created what many believe to be the best film of the franchise. So of course, he'd have to try and outdo himself in Furious 6. We're not dealing with cops, we're not dealing with drug dealers. It's a whole different level. Fast Five set a new standard for Fast and Furious movies. Many people still believe it was the best one in the franchise. Sounds personal to me. For a long time, Lin always espoused how important cars were to the characters that drove them. I think every time when we make these films, to pick the cars as the extension of the character. Now, with Fast and Furious 6, he had the ability to create and acquire some truly unique vehicles, and he used their distinct properties to push the action further than it's ever gone before. One of the most exciting things for me was the idea of the flip car. Justin called me early on and said, you know, I want something that's, you know, gonna run head on into vehicles and launch them into the air. It came really from the design of who Shaw is. He is someone that will go right into the middle of a storm and demolish everything in its way. Building custom cars from scratch was nothing new for Dennis McCarthy and his team, but they really went above and beyond with Shaw's flip car. It can drive in ways regular cars can't, thanks to its front and rear steering, which allows it to crab around and drive sideways. But not everyone was convinced that the flip car would do what its namesake promised. I remember sitting down with Andy and Spiro, and they're like, it's gonna be great, but you actually can't flip the cars. It's too hard. And I said, well, let's just try it. The initial plan was to just shoot the car flips the old fashioned way with a pipe ramp, just like they did when Dom charged headlong into a semi all those films ago. But that all quickly changed once they realized the flip car actually worked. When Justin saw the results of what we were able to do, it called me up and goes, I want you to add more police cars, flip more police cars, crash more police cars. It, uh, that was pretty fun. On screen, the flip car was definitely causing a ruckus, but it wasn't the only tool the filmmakers used to create mayhem on the streets of London. Take this super cannon, for instance. This thing is able to launch a car 45 feet before it hits the ground and starts tumbling. The reason I like this special effects shotgun thing we're using is that it actually shoots the car out accurately in one straight line, and it gets it to roll many times so the cars have time to either veer around it or hit it. And because we're able to control this roll, we're able to put cameras in a better position to tell the story. These stunts are expensive to run, even for just one take, which is why some stunts could have up to 12 cameras covering it. And in typical Fast and Furious fashion, they're also using the latest and greatest in camera tech to get that perfect shot. We also had the Omnicopter. Uh, the guys that go over the top of buildings and swoop down into the cars and some really cool shots. Despite The Rock's vain attempt to stop Shaw in London, he still got away, which means the entire company had to move to the Canary Islands to try and stop Shaw once again on the island's brand new highways that conveniently weren't open to the public. Everything we do is going to be practical, and to have a government that was that open to say, hey, yeah, come over, and uh, we have these brand new highways you can wreck. <laughs> It made all the difference. Lin chose to shoot in the Canary Islands instead of building a set because it meant he could put more of the budget in front of the camera. So, of course, he spent the money on real tanks. We had two real tanks. One of them had the full turret, which was 60 tons. Then the other one didn't have a turret on. So we made a turret that was 20 tons lighter. So that was called the lightweight tank. And then we had two that we built on truck chassis. Let's have some fun. 
but we ended up using the real tank 90% of the time. There's no substitute for it. Just the feel of it rolling down the street. And that makes sense, since they went through all that trouble acquiring actual tanks. All these shots, like the tank smashing through the cargo truck and other cars, are real. That includes Roman's jump from his Mustang to Brian's Ford Escort. We had an overhead wire rig on our stunt double, but we had to give him enough room that he could jump to Brian's car. So we get it all up to speed, three, two, one, now. He jumped it, sucked under that car in a heartbeat. There's nothing left, nothing left. Even Brian's escort jump was real, and not like the quote unquote real jumps from Fast Five or Too Fast Too Furious, which were gutted cars with dummies in them. This jump had a real stunt driver who had to do a real jump twice because he flipped it on the first try. Yeah, today, yeah. yeah, it was a good one. The special effects team also rigged up this debris mobile filled with cars and fake concrete. So when the tank shot at the bridge, it collapsed. But the hardest stunt to pull off was the tank flip. Flipping the tank was challenging. We originally were told we're not gonna flip it. And just days before it was time to do it, one of the tests worked really well. After creating a tank skin for the flippable tank, they were ready to shoot. The only thing left to shoot, which also needed heavy CGI, was Letty's Leap of Faith, which was shot on green screen and composed into the highway sequence later. Finally, we make it to F6's piece de resistance, Shaw's escape attempt in the Antonov cargo plane, which was easily Justin Lin's most ambitious action sequence during his first stint on the franchise. Frankly, it had to be. He just used a tank chase as act two filler. The Antonov sequence, I'd never done anything close to that scale. It was the ultimate challenge, basically designed seven action sequences that's happening all at once. This was a complex sequence to pull off, not only because there was a load going on plot-wise, but also because they couldn't acquire a whole plane. I felt it was important to have something practical to always play with. So we, we basically built our own Antonov. Three different plane set pieces were built to get all the shots needed for the sequence. For shots like these, where the cars were driving next to the landing gear, a 75 by 50 foot section of the fuselage was built that was completely finished up to 30 feet high. And since the Antonov was supposed to be taking off and all, these hulking plane sections actually needed to move. And we built a system whereby we could tow it down the runway at up to about 30, 35 miles an hour, using a big six wheel, 500 horsepower turbocharged truck. A 100-foot section of the cargo bay with its doors were also built so the cars would be able to drive on and off the set piece while it was in motion. And for the climax, they built a one-to-one -one scale section of the fuselage and wings that also needed to be set on fire. But we'll get back to that in one bit. First, we need to talk about the small army it took to get this sequence in the can. It took 200 people working three weeks of night shoots to get it all done. And since it was a night shoot, one of the things that they needed to accommodate for was lighting, which significantly added to the complexity of the shoot. We could light the runway, but you couldn't light from the airplane because we didn't have an airplane. So they built these lighting rigs on trucks that would move with us for the sequence as the lighting grid. And so the runway became very busy with this massive Antonov going down the center of the runway with lighting trucks following you at speed. It was coordinated commotion getting all the stunt drivers to hit their marks, but that's old hat for the sixth movie of this franchise. Nevertheless, Justin Lin had a huge cargo plane to play with and relied on some classic Fast and Furious tricks to produce some stunts the Fast and Furious audience had never seen before. This sequence where the plane is trying to lift off pulling the cars into the air with it? Think of it like cooking in Zelda Breath of the Wild. But instead of Link, it's Justin Lin cooking something new with familiar ingredients. It's made of one part car harpoon from the first heist chase. Another ingredient was the motion-based tech they used to shoot the CGI sections of the Fast Five train leap. And the final ingredient was tying two cars together and hoisting them up so that you could shoot it practically. And all of this was done to provide the dramatic tension for what is one of the coolest shots in any Fast and Furious film, Dom's fiery escape from the hull of the Antonov. When we did the, the plane crashing, that was pretty tricky. We had to get 12 cameras set up, and they all had to be at the right spot, and it was a huge deal. 
To pull this shot off, they had to do it in two separate segments. First, they had to build this huge one-to-one -one skeleton of the plane that they could light on fire and drag down the runway at scale. Then, separately, they shoot Dom's car jump, which required its own rig that had its own nose that exploded before the charger was launched through it. That fire you see and the explosions you see are practical. Our main hero, when he jumped out of the nose, that was real. His car flipping was real. The vehicles, when they lifted off the ground, they were practical. And the ADs and the stunt people, everybody did a great job. What makes this scene so impressive is all the ingenuity it took to shoot as much practically as they did. It takes a deep understanding of many filmmaking disciplines to understand where the line is on what absolutely needs to be shot practically and what can be faked with CGI. Sure, most of the plane was digitally replaced in post, but I dare you to look away from all that practically shot action to even notice. The absolute necessity for practical action to sell CGI set dressing was a lesson Justin Lin pushed to the absolute limit on every Fast and Furious set, and for his penultimate entry into the franchise, the action might be his greatest accomplishment. But after defeating Shaw, the Fast family finally earned their amnesty, and for the first time since the first Fast and Furious, the extended Fast family was able to sit down for a family meal. That's good enough for me. Say goodbye to their beloved director who reinvented the franchise and give thanks for the franchise's first billion dollar take at the box office. All right, y'all, come on, let's do this. Obviously, the franchise would continue, but now it would be horror director James Wan's turn to dive headfirst into his first action movie. Let's not mince words. James Wan had big shoes to fill with Furious 7. It's not fair. Leading the charge on a $190 million movie is a daunting task, especially when you need to figure out action sequences that bring something new to an audience who has already devoured six previous entries. The audience has seen just about everything with all of our fast films, so we really kind of brainstorm amongst all of us to try and figure out what we can do that's different and interesting that will wow the audience. Can somebody just walk me through what we're supposed to be doing? Come on, Ron, this is your plan. But you have to give James Wan credit. He came ready with some absurd ideas. Hell, it's probably what got him the job. The very first stunt sequence that I designed was our heroes parachuting out of the back of a plane in their cars and at the very last minute break their parachute and then rescue this particular character. That idea would germinate into one of the franchise's most sophisticated chases because it provides a ton of interesting challenges. Can we drop cars out of the sky? Will they land right? And is it even possible to drive a bus and flip it on a narrow mountain? That ain't gonna happen. I'll see you at the pickup. This parachute sequence by itself was such a complex proposition, it got second unit director and longtime Fast and Furious veteran Spiro Rosados spooked but he was ready for the challenge. What they didn't really realize was there were so many factors that are more complicated than probably any other sequence I've shot. So we definitely want to be low enough to see the chute opening in front of us. Right on. The good news for the gang was that dropping cars out of a C-130 has been done before. The bad news was that they still had to figure out how to actually control and photograph cars that are in free fall. And so that was the R&D part of it, trying to figure out how to get all these cars out of the C-130 together with guys in the air with it and make them drop flat. You need some fresh air? Because you're about to get a whole lot of it. They're free falling at 175, and so the skydivers could never catch them. They had to be a part of the car when it went out. So he said, you guys grab onto the cars, just run out with them and grab onto it so that its first initial drop, when it's gaining its terminal velocity, you're with it. And that was the key element that made it all work. Even though it took a bit to figure out, the second unit got some truly amazing footage, even if a few of the cars didn't survive their jumps. And of the four cars, we lost two of them because of winds. Dad! I hate you, Dad! Now that they got all this great footage of cars actually plummeting to Earth, it was time to pair it up with some inserts of actors on blue screen. James Wan really brought a ton of energy to his inserts. Look at how he shot Vin Diesel. Not only was his car on a gimbal that could almost go completely vertical, but they photographed him with a camera truck that dollied in from 200 yards away. This kinetic camera work in a completely controlled environment is what made these inserts feel so seamless, because it matched the hectic motion of the cameras that were free falling at 175 miles an hour. Woo! Now we're moving. 
What goes up must come down, and a whole other contraption was invented to have these cars hit the ground running. It kind of worked like the zip line in Too Fast, Too Furious, but now it released the car at a certain height. So Dan Sudek, our effects coordinator, came up with this trolley idea where he starts one crane very, very high up in the air, and then we pull the car all the way to the very top, which is almost 180, 200 feet up. It worked like a charm. Now Dom and the gang were on to phase two, overtaking the bus. The use of the battering ram was a nice touch for the team to get within striking distance of the bus. The action that follows, though still exhilarating, is some of Fantastic Four's greatest hits. Hook them up. Car harpoons. Pipe ramps. And jumping from a hood of another vehicle just don't move the needle anymore. But this right here, my friend, happens to be the stupidest idea I've ever heard of in my life. But once Brian saves Ramsey, the chase really goes downhill in a good way. You're pointing the wrong way. Am I not? Rosados has directed enough Fast and Furious action to know that this impact was crucial because it would both sell Deckard Shaw as a big bad and push the chase into the woods. Then our heroes go off-road, which was something that we've never seen before in this particular franchise. Seeing cars going off crazy terrain was really exciting. I remember Chris Morgan pitching to me that sequence and saying that it should feel like this speeder bike sequence in Return of the Jedi. And just like in Return of the Jedi, one of the goons has to meet their untimely end with a tree. But instead of just crashing into a stump, the stunt team jumped a car 80 feet into a long steel tree that completely impaled it. What are you doing? This is crazy! While Dom was charging downhill toward his eventual standoff with Jaconde, the action on the bus was gearing up to take center stage. The highlights for me was designing the Brian bus sequence. While Brian was busy trying to hold his own against Tony Jaa, the second unit was trying to figure out if they could actually drive a bus at speed and flip it on these narrow mountain roads. It turns out, Rosados knew a guy. I have to say, I am impressed. He brought in Mike Ryan, the guy in this video racing semi-trucks down Pikes Peak to do all the bus stunt driving, including the flip. So when we flipped the bus, it wasn't about putting cannons and get this nice flip. It's about getting it to travel and get distance. Too slow. Of course, Juan and co. dragged that bus right to the edge of a conveniently placed cliff, setting up a climax that has become all too familiar, but not in a bad way, to Fast and Furious chases, the leap of faith. And just like Dom and Brian's leap in Fast Five, they got a stuntman to actually do it. And he hit it absolutely perfect. He is right on the back corner of the bus as it drops 150 feet to the bottom, and now he's in the air, you know. We obviously had all the safety you can do. He was cabled, but he was really running on it. It really went off a cliff, and then we really took the bus and dropped it off of another cliff that went on forever and ever. You know, for good measure. good? Thank you. Throughout Furious 7, it seems like James Wan was hell-bent on trying to make cars fly. The amount of practical effects in the parachute chase was astounding. The building jump, however, is frankly impossible, and that's what makes it such an interesting challenge for the Fast and Furious team. Time to unleash the beast. You know it's going to have CGI, they know it's going to have CGI, but the magic of these films is watching how they blur the line between the fake and the practical, and it's what keeps the audiences coming back for more. The Abu Dhabi tower jump, of course, starts with Dom and Brian trying to steal a car at a party in a high rise. We were able to shoot that on stage and bring in 150 party members all dressed to the max in evening gowns and tuxedos. You have no idea what level this party's about to go to. It's pretty standard fare. They crash the party with the lichen right before Shaw shows up to start some Ready and action! Then I got word from James Wan who said, hey, I want Jason Statham to come in here and start firing a machine gun at the car. 
After Dom hits Shaw with his car, he also hits every piece of set dressing before Brian realizes... Don't park, don't fly. If you think the shots of the lichen soaring through the sky are CGI, it's because they are. But these small moments as the lichen enters and exits the buildings were actually shot. To do it, they built a multi-story skyscraper facade set in a parking lot. We had 40 feet of trussing deck, and then the windows were built on that, and Dan put the car on one of his air mortars, and we would shoot it out of that window and into boxes. It survived! We would get the exit from one side and then get the entrance on the other side. And we did it multiple times for different buildings that we're supposed to go into. With the skyscraper facade wrapped, they still needed an interior set for the car to drive through. For the second building interior, Juan wanted it to look like an unfinished office floor. So they built it with open walls, a ton of aluminum framing, and turned it over to the special effects team to prep for the shoot. No, 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 no. Effects is squib these windows, they'll be going hot, they're gonna blow the windows. These are breakaway aluminum frames. As the car comes through, all that's gonna break and go with the car. To get the car up to speed before crashing onto set, they also had to build a pretty long ramp. I built ramps that were three feet tall, 120 feet long, and I had Steve Kelso drive it as fast as he could drive it and drop off. He had about five or six feet between there and the window. So we could get him dropping as if he's dropping in, hitting, and then just slamming through everything that was in that second building. Nice. All right. Once they got the unfinished floor in the can, they immediately launched themselves into the final building leap. The art gallery wasn't a whole new set, it was just the empty floor set redressed to be an art gallery. But the redressed set, populated with stunt people, posed a new challenge. They needed to get the hell out of the way quickly, because they might not see the lichen coming until it was too late. They can't see the car. It's on a countdown, and so I say, we're gonna say three, two, one. Everybody has to be moving. You can't be thinking to move. You gotta be moving, because the car's coming in really fast. So that was the tough part. Three, two, one, go! The last thing they needed to shoot was Dom and Brian bailing from the spinning car. They built a rig to get the car spinning, but the whole bailing thing wasn't as easy as it looked. So we tested it, we took the doors off and said, let's see if you guys can jump out of the spinning car. And we found out that if you don't jump out as it's starting to spin, the back tail end hits you. You're rotating in there, you don't really know where you are. So the stunt guys had to look for some kind of pinpoint area out on the set. And they said, when I see this come around, I know I have to go out. We said, okay, and action. But they weren't done yet. Then I got a message from James and he said, oh, by the way, I want Vin's character to hang up on the edge. So I had to put that character on a cable and rotate the car in so that he could jump out of the car and not penetrate the glass. And for the extra dramatic effect, and since this is a Fast and Furious movie, they also dropped the car from 60 feet just to get an IRL shot of its impact. James Wan's stint as a Fast and Furious director might have been short, but it made one hell of an impact. You've got an interesting interpretation there of low key. Furious 7's chases routinely pop up at the top, usually in the top three, of Fast and Furious chase listicles, which get reassessed every time a new entry drops. More than that, Furious 7 is still the highest grossing Fast and Furious movie ever, bringing in $1.5 billion at the box office. You say what? Honey, honey. See, sometimes I be overthinking, man. Unfortunately, all that success didn't come without tragedy. Paul Walker died during the production of this film in an unrelated car accident. Furious 7 would be Walker's last film, but Brian O'Connor still lives on in the Fast universe. However, in the lead up to Fast X, Vin Diesel has told Total Film, quote, I will give you this without spoiling anything. I couldn't imagine this saga ending without truly saying goodbye to Brian O'Connor. Hey, thought you could leave without saying goodbye. For the eighth entry, the franchise brought on a new director, F. Gary Gray, whose filmography kind of makes him a low-key perfect guy to direct a Fast and Furious movie because he can juggle so many genres. Oh, 
it. We're going to need a bigger truck. Need him to direct comedy? He did that with Friday. Damn! Need some tense drama? The negotiator director is on set. Never say no to a hostage taker. He even understands car chases because he directed the Italian Job remake, which is a movie that probably wouldn't have existed without the Fast and Furious franchise in the first place. That is just a long-winded way of saying Gray is very capable of taking the fate of the Furious in a new direction. And that's exactly what he did. For one, this is the only movie in the history of the franchise whose best scene doesn't even involve a car. Shaw saving Dom's son by giving him headphones to listen to the chipmunks so he doesn't get upset while Shaw wipes out an entire plane of goons is an absolute joy to watch and, in and of itself, is a masterclass in action directing. Go for a ride. But this isn't a video about baby shootouts. Maybe it should be, though. Where's that smile? There it is. No, 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 no. This is a video about car chases. And besides, we've come this far. I know family is so important to you. The car chases in Fate are very good, but except for a few specific moments, they are car chases we've more or less seen before. F. Gary Gray chose to make a more character-focused fast, well, as character-focused as a fast movie can be. He knows it doesn't matter what's under a hood. The only thing that matters is who's behind the wheel. And it shows in its action, which relies more on character beats than plot points to drive the action forward. Take Dom's heel turn, where he has to go to New York City to steal the nuclear codes from the Russian Minister of Defense. The plague of self-driving zombie cars that Cypher unleashes on the city to aid Dom is some truly awesome action choreography. No one's ready for this. And we'll get to it in a bit. Despite all that action, it's not the climax of the sequence. That belongs to when Dom is confronted by the gang, which speaks to those smaller character moments Gray is trying to probe in his film. I think I know where my team's at. Where? Right in front of me. This confrontation where the gang uses, you guessed it, car harpoons to try and trap Dom is very well done. We've seen the car harpoon so many times before, but it works this time because it's being used against one of their own. More than that, the scene also does an incredible job using the harpoon tug of war to visualize the emotional undertone of the scene, which is that Dom's villainy is literally tearing them apart. Anyway, back to the stunts. There is some legit cool stuff going on in this zombie car sequence. When we first started talking about the zombie cars, we knew that we were gonna have a bunch of cars driving around with no drivers in them. So we devised a system that we could put into almost any of the cars where we could have a driver, he would be mechanically connected and do high-speed stunt scenes with a car that appears to have no driver. That is an amazingly long-winded way of saying they dress the stunt drivers to look like car seats, but it was going to take just a bit more ingenuity to pull off this next stunt. Gary had spawned the idea of the raining cars, and to do it was a whole, obviously, a whole nother thing is how do we actually have cars coming out of a parking structure with cars moving? First thing they had to do was find a parking garage that would allow them to shoot there. As they were scouting garages, they noticed that most of them had underground tunnels beneath them, which was a problem. And the ground underneath is only like four feet thick and that you're gonna punch through and hit a subway system. So we came up with the idea of let's put steel trench plates down on top of the ground and then we'll paint the ground like the actual tarmac. Once they were confident the cars weren't going to crash through the road, they started testing out the stunt itself by dropping cars from various heights and figuring out the mechanisms needed to have cars drop at specific time intervals. It was very important to Spiro Rosados, the second unit director, that he gets shots of seven cars in the air at the same time. We have to pull these cars at an exact speed, and we're doing that using the winch on the crane and set a little trip. And after that, each car comes out in succession to land on the vehicles on the road here. Obviously, there's no one in them because they're about to be impaled by 3,000 pound lawn darts. F. Gary Gray and his team destroyed 65 cars for this one shot. 
you've never seen on a Fast and Furious movie pile this many cars together in one shot. And speaking of that many cars, if it seems like there's even more cars in the final shot, that's because there is. This sequence had to leverage a decent amount of CGI, but only in ways that augmented the action. Shooting in New York City, where this chase takes place, is hard as f which is why they shot it in Cleveland. Get ready, Cleveland. The last man to screw you this hard then disappear was LeBron James. So a lot of these shots had some digital buildings added to make it look more like NYC, or had more cars added to make it seem like more of a swarm. But all the most dangerous looking action stayed true to the Fast and Furious ethos. It was all done practically. Oh. Despite having an estimated budget of $250 million, it wasn't quite enough for them to secure a real submarine. What the hell is he talking about? In layman's terms, she just carjacked a submarine. Even without this sub, the sequence has some rad ice driving, the rock kicking a torpedo, and what might be the biggest explosion in any fast movie. Even before they got started shooting in Iceland, they needed to make sure the ice could support all the cars they were going to race around on it. We're standing on a lake right now, you guys. 22 inches of ice. But when we first got here, we couldn't even put a car out here. We didn't come out here on snowmobiles because it would a car would fall It was only eight inches when we first came out. Why Just to figure out if we can shoot, if it's safe enough, it's a production in itself. To make sure the ice was safe to shoot on, there was a 10-person team which included rescue divers, medics, and an ice engineer who would go out and measure ice thickness to ensure it was safe to shoot on. The engineers would take a look at it and they would know within 5-10 minutes how many pounds per square foot we could then put on the ice. We had 16 cars out there one time on a lake. That's a lot of weight. I don't think anybody ever shot with that many cars on a frozen lake. Now that they were safe to be on the ice, it was time to bring out the cars. Dom has driven a Charger in almost all of the Fast and Furious movies, and for eight, they realized they could keep Dom's love of Chargers fresh by putting it on ice. This winter Charger was custom built from the ground up. Since it would be in the snow, they made it an all-wheel drive Charger. And since it would be taking on a ton of jumps, they also really beefed up its suspension. I just love the concept of seeing all four tires spinning, the snow blowing off each wheel. That's something different. That's something that we've never done. 500 plus horsepower. When I say all-wheel drive, I mean, it's a locker in the back, a locker in the front, transfer case is locked solid. I mean, it's all four tires are spinning. The car is capable of 130 miles an hour. And the Charger needed that power to take on those snow dunes, push around that rocket launcher, and most importantly, outrun this surfacing submarine. All right. Come and get it. Let's get this out of the way right now. This submarine was definitely CGI that was added later, but the ice explosion that the sub created, that is 100% real. What they've asked me to do is to try and bend the surface of the ice in a sphere shape directly underneath the bad guys. To pull this stunt off, they set up tow cables to pull four of the bad guys' vehicles up to 30 miles per hour. And when they hit a specific rigged patch of ice, boom. This is gonna be the single largest amount of high explosives that will set off 180 pounds. So what we do, stick the dynamite in a six gallon pail of ammonium nitrate. We drill a hole in the ice. We sink in a bucket. There's gonna be four of them, one for each vehicle. And then we're able to pull the vehicle right over the top of it and not deviate you know, an inch in either direction. Once they get directly above the ammonium nitrate, we trigger our button and we blow the ice up. And that should give us about 20 to 30 feet of lift on each of the vehicles. We should have all four vehicles flying in the air, flipping, tossing, turning, and about a 200-foot geyser going up into the sky with chunks of ice this big. You won't hear it too much because the water muffles the sound, but you will definitely feel it in your bones. Oh, We're gonna need a bigger truck. Cypher ultimately gets away, but when Dom blows up the sub, which is an insane thing to say considering seven movies ago he was a DVD player thief, Don't push it! You embarrass me! his fam swarms to protect him from the blast. It's a nice visual callback to earlier in the film where the gang surrounded him, but he ultimately pushed them away. No! Cut to the obligatory family dinner scene where the Fast family becomes just a little bit bigger. All this fuss over you and they can sit around and laugh all the way to the bank. 
While this wasn't the biggest fast movie at the box office, it was the second to clear $1 billion. It also launched the pretty solid Hobbs and Shaw spinoff, which we'll be skipping since it's not a mainline Fast and Furious movie. All show and no God. Why? Because my voice is getting a little bit strained, and I've been wanting to talk about this magnet chase for like an hour now. These movies are just so popular now, they don't even need titles. This is the first movie of the series that just sounds like it's named after a car model, the F9. Anyway, it seems that Justin Lin just couldn't stay away. He came back to direct his fifth film of the franchise, so of course he was going to try some crazy new stuff, like send Roman and Tej into space in a Pontiac Fiero. Consider that its obligatory mention. There. Right there, you see it? I love that scene, but it's all CGI and blue screen. We're here for the good stuff, the practical stuff, and F9 had plenty of that too. Another thing the franchise did in F9 that it has never done before was flashback. Remember this line from the OG Fast and Furious? I watched my dad burn to death. I remembered hearing him scream. Lynn decided to turn that memory into celluloid to use it as the inciting incident that generates the rift between Dom and his newly acknowledged brother, Jacob. To pull that race accident off took a lot of planning and multiple setups to get it in the can. First, they shot a stunt driver driving Jack Toretto's car to make it slide out sideways. Then, they built two rigs, one that attached Jack Toretto's car to the front of Kenny Linder's and a pipe rail. So, when Jack's car, which was being pushed by Kenny's, hits the rail, the back end would flare up. And then we re-rigged another one that had a cannon in it with the same push mechanism. And now we move it down and boom, cannon the car in the air and now it starts flipping in the air towards the fence. Piece all that together and you've got exactly what Justin wanted. That crash might have been the big bang that eventually sent Jacob into exile, but the first time audiences met him was in the jungles of Monte Quinto. Shooting the jungle chase in Thailand was extremely difficult because pretty much everything needed to be built from scratch. You really can't film in a jungle, a real jungle because you just, there's no way to get a car through it. So we had to find things that looked like jungle that were private land, and most of them were palm oil plantations. Because it's palm trees, the ground is like clay. We did a bunch of tests and ended up having to make our own roads. They built over a half mile of roads out of palm leaves and gravel, which then had to be run over with a car multiple times to get the water out. But once they got those roads in working order, they were ready to start prepping the shoot. Thailand was probably more explosions for a sequence than we've done on any fast. Effects had dug big holes in the ground and put big mortars with like 10 pounds of naphthalene and then a bunch of moss and dirt over the top of that. Huge explosions, probably 25, 30 foot fireballs every time. There was just one problem. According to the stunt coordinator, Andy Gill, the holes for the pyro might be too big for vehicles like Letty's motorcycle to navigate safely. But they came up with an ingenious solution. They put grates across the holes so that no one could get stuck. This had an added benefit, which allowed some of the vehicles to actually drive over the explosive holes, allowing the cars to get closer to the danger. Of course, they also put extra steel plates under the drivers to keep them safe. But the most memorable part of this scene is Dom's rope swing with the car. To get this sequence in the can, they actually shot Dom's car doing the jump and hitting the post. Of course, these wide shots are all CGI, but Dom and Letty are pulling some Gs here because they actually shot them in a rotating car on a gimbal. And the landing was real too. To do it, they rigged cables to the front and back of the car to violently pull it right where it needed to be. This Charger Tarzan jump is a classic execution of Lin's ability to create real feeling stunts even when everyone knows it's absolutely impossible. He's able to do it because he understands how to cleverly sandwich some CGI excessiveness in between practically photographed bookends. Okay, we're almost at the magnet chase. This first scene where the gang really shows off the power of the magnet is one of the most technically sophisticated shots the Fast franchise has pulled off in years. This one shot is actually two stitched together, which were shot separately. You can clearly see it in the raw footage. In the first shot where the car enters the whiskey store, there's a lighting setup behind the car and there's no truck to catch it. On the reverse shot, the other half of the store is missing. The lighting has been repositioned to the other side, but now the truck was there to catch the car. To get the car to travel through the store, they used some track technology similar to the tech used in Furious 7 to fire the Lycan out of those skyscraper windows. This time, though, they added a mechanism to flip the car on its side before the car started moving down the track. Eventually, they needed to combine the two shots to make it look like this effect was seamlessly done in one take. 
That was able to happen thanks to those motion control arms that had cameras mounted to them. Those arms' movement are computer programmed so they can recreate the exact same camera move as many times as they needed. It's been almost 20 years since the first film introduced the MIC rig, which almost seems quaint now. But even after all this time, the franchise still continues to push the envelope with camera technology, using it to find spectacular new ways to actually photograph stunts instead of just creating them digitally. To think all that creativity was used to pretty much just introduce the audience to the power of the fam's magnet tech, which will be used to great effect in the Tbilisi chase. Enter the Armadillo. This 26-ton behemoth took four months to build from scratch and is one hell of a visualization of an unmovable object that is about to meet an unstoppable force. Not only does a magnet pull things in, it also repels things. So we wanted to come up with some cool ideas of repelling it. One of the ideas we had was two bad guys chasing Dom, and he pulls the cars in with the magnet. At the same time, he pushes them away right when he sees parked cars on either side. To pull this shot off, they modified the parked cars to severely weaken their structural integrity, so when the trucks hit them, they tore right through them. But the scene also needed one of the trucks to flip over for dramatic effect, so the stunt team hit a wall in that yellow van. When the car hit it, it did exactly what you'd expect it to do. And to get these shots where they use magnets to pull parked cars into the path of the armadillo, the effects team rigged up these things called car shooters. So we had effects build car shooters, which are big air mortars that have tubes in cars that you put on the air mortar and the cars are on rollers. And they're on the sides of the road. And as this truck's coming, they just start firing at the truck. Those casters on the cars are a real nice touch because they allow the car to move in a direction that isn't oriented with the car's tires. It really sells the lie that the car is being pulled against its will. I never get tired of uh, cars crashing into each other. The more we do it, the more we do try to challenge each other. That's the one element that's constant is that the adrenaline rush when we plan a stunt practically and just launch it, you know, just see what happens. For over 20 years, the Fast franchise has been pushing the envelope on what a practically photographed car chase can actually do, and action movies as a genre have been better for it. I've always found irony in the fact that to make these big, dumb action movies, it takes a ton of smart and talented people to not only conceive and execute the impossible, but to do it safely. Oh my god! I don't want to die! Edition. Just to be clear, calling these movies dumb is not a jab. I love these movies. Hell, I just spent over an hour talking about them. They're some of the most fun popcorn flicks around because they always deliver on what all popcorn flicks need to do well. Generate spectacle worthy of a 30-foot screen. Okay, here we go! Hey everybody, thanks so much for watching. If you've got another hour to spend dissecting special effects, be sure to check out our top 10 practical effects of all time video. Or for a shorter, wittier list, check out our top 10 screenplays of all time. And for everything else, be sure to subscribe to Cinefix.